Hey, how's it going guys? It's Nate here. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, it has finally arrived. After 49 episodes, if there's one thing I think we've learned, it's that Skyrim is not a minuscule game by any stretch of the imagination. After 7 years of being on the market, and 490 tiny details, The Elder Scrolls V has proven to be what seemingly half of my comment section has deemed and insists that I call a thick game. Regardless of the adjectives we use to describe it, however unacademic, it's almost as if Bethesda's medieval fantasy will never run out of secrets for us to dig up and easter eggs to uncover. So, sit back and relax as we jump right into our 50th installment of yet another 10 tiny details you may still have missed in The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. Starting off, Plotus and his wife Solania Carvain are two characters we've discussed before on this channel. They're imperial nobles at the center of one of Skyrim's more humorous random encounters. When we see them for the first time, they'll be on the roads accompanied by a guard, on their way to the wedding of Vittoria Vici, the cousin of the Emperor himself. Plotus claims to be a successful merchant, and getting in Vittoria's good graces he thinks might be a way to earn favor with the Emperor, so he's bringing loads of gifts. Both Imperials are very full of themselves, and will carry quite the high and mighty attitude, talking down to the player consistently. Alas, what goes around comes around, and later on, after some time has passed in game, we can encounter the two again. And now, no longer will they be in their noble clothes, instead dressed in rags, without a guard. Evidently, they fell victim to bandit muggings, wildlife attacks, and even a bit of dragon fire. Now their pride has been tarnished. Considering how rude they were though, it's hard not to smirk at how they've been humbled. But what you may not have known is that while Plotus and Solania are two very stuck up unfriendly individuals, they actually seem to descend from one of Tamriel's greatest heroes. You see, in the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion, an Imperial named Norina Carvain was the Countess, basically the governor of the Cyrodelic County of Bruma. And towards the latter portions of the Oblivion questline, as an onslaught of Daedric armies were pillaging about the Imperial heartlands, Narana played a pivotal role in planning the final battle with them at the gates of her city, alongside the player and Martin Septim, which, as we all know, was thankfully a pretty big success. And with her help, the Daedric hordes were defeated. Beyond that, prior to the final climactic battle, Bruma's Countess was still consistently helpful and kind, yet also described as effective. So, while Plotus Carvain may be an unprepared jerk, his ancestors were anything but, and would probably be very disappointed. Next on our list, during the Dark Brotherhood quest, The Cure for Madness, Astrid will give the player the legendary dark steed Shadowmere, so you can hurry up and hunt down Cicero, who recently went nuts, even more nuts than normal, and attacked some of his fellow assassins before fleeing. Shadowmere is a strange and mysterious stallion, a mount that's been in the Brotherhood for at least 200 years. Not much is known about him, or maybe her. But as we approach the mount for the first time, something interesting will happen. We'll be given a quest objective to, quote, Behold Shadowmere, that we'll automatically complete as we walk up to the horse. Now, this doesn't seem like much, but in Skyrim's files, every single quest objective has an attached identification number. It's usually in increments of 1, 5, or 10. So your first objective in a quest might be flagged as 1, the second 10, the third 15, you get the picture. But the identification number of the Behold Shadowmere objective is 666, a series of digits quite commonly associated with all things evil. It's blatantly obvious Bethesda did this on purpose, especially when you consider the previous objective's ID was 19, and the next one's is 25. So this clearly was intentional, and whoever was coding this level at BGS was definitely having a bit of fun. Coming in at number 3, as a reward for completing Vermina's Daedric quest, Waking Nightmare, and siding with the Daedric goddess of all things bad dreams, she'll give you her unique staff, the Skull of Corruption. When used, this artifact will deal 20 points of health damage to foes. 
At first, this doesn't seem like much. Though, it's got this unique little quirk, where you can charge it by using the artifact on people who are asleep. After it's been charged, its damage more than doubles, to 50, which is pretty good, even for the higher tier levels of equipment in the game. But what if I were to tell you, Skyrim isn't the first game the Skull of Corruption has been featured in, and that in previous Elder Scrolls titles, it was actually even better. The staff made its debut in the Elder Scrolls II Daggerfall. When used against foes in that game, it didn't damage them, but instead it created a clone of their character, and that clone would go on to attack the original. In the event the clone defeated their original, then the clone themselves would just disappear, and all would be well. Later on, in the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion, the Skull of Corruption made an appearance again, and it basically did the same thing as in Daggerfall allowing you to create doubles of NPCs that would go on to attack the person they're based off of. So, in all honesty, while I'm a huge fan of this item in Skyrim, the reality is this object could've and should've been a lot cooler. For fourth spot, we set sail for the Sea of Ghosts. Here, floating on a chunk of ice just north of the Chill, Winterhold's creative prison, one of the wackiest sights in all of Tamriel can be spotted. A petting zoo's worth of creatures sits on this iceberg. Multiple wolves, horkers, and even a few goats are all just hanging out on the same, extremely small slab of ice. Now, I say hanging out, but as you approach their AI will trigger, and chaos will ensue as the animals begin to devour one another. It's worth mentioning that typically the horkers will come out on top, thanks to their impressive health stat, Yet, we're left wondering, how did all these furry and fatty friends get here? Horkers are understandable, but what about the wolves? Did they just swim out here? And goats make utterly no sense at all, seeing as the closest plant life is miles away. My suspicion is that a level designer was probably just having a little bit of fun. Then again, there is a literal college campus's worth of mages just down the street. Halfway through at number 5, Hjolmarch is a hold going through quite a bit. Sitting on the front lines of a civil war, led by a strange psychic Jarl that would make Bran freak out, and to top it all off, the capital city has a bit of a vampire problem. Indeed, as we learn in the side quest, Laid to Rest, an ancient vampire by the name of Movarth has taken residence in a cave nearby and is leading a conspiracy to enthrall the entire settlement's population. Thankfully, we, the Dragonborn, should the mission be accepted, will get to foil this plan. However, in the early stages of Laid to Rest, just as we're beginning to figure out the undead have their gaze set on Morthal, it will be discovered that Alva, one of the town's longtime residents, is secretly a vampire herself, working to advance Movarth's twisted goals and we'll have to make sure she pays the iron price for her crimes. Yet, before Alva's hidden vampiric allegiances are discovered, the game will throw a number of clues at us that something's not right about her. For one, she only leaves her home at night. If you catch up with her before the quest, there's dialogue that's already very suggestive. And, oh, yeah, she has a coffin in her house, if that's all not enough. But among Bethesda's low-key and not-so-low-key suggestions of Alva's secret nature is one subtle clue that many players can easily overlook. Her home in Morthal is surrounded by Death Bell and Nightshade plants, and it's the only one like that at that. Both Nightshade and Death Bell are two flower types in Skyrim, heavily associated with death. Each is rare, poisonous, and has a tendency to grow near graveyards and corpses. In fact, Deathbell specifically is cited by one alchemist for having a reputation to grow best where the unfortunate have perished. So such a large concentration of both of these plants around a single woman's home, considering their scarcity and legacy, should have raised a few more eyebrows in Morthal than it did. Sixth, we have another one of those facts that's rooted within Skyrim's game files. Earning the title of Thane in a Jarl's Court will give you the ability to purchase property in any select hold, as well as a bit of leeway in that region's legal system. In each of the nine holds, save Whiterun where it's earned automatically through the game's main quest line, 
Fainship can be gained by completing miscellaneous tasks or otherwise helping three to five of that hold citizens. In your journal, such an objective will be referred to as, quote, assist the people of, insert hold name here. However, in the game's creation kit, this objective is instead titled, making friends and influencing people. A clear tip of the Iron Helmet to Dale Carnegie's best-selling book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Again, this name for the quest is only visible in the game's creation kit or via console commands. So, it's an especially well-hidden easter egg, but one that the community has managed to dig up regardless. Next, speaking of literature, during the quest, Forbidden Knowledge, as we descend into the dwarven ruins of Avenchisel to locate an ancient artifact known as the Lexicon, we'll bear witness to a number of weird aberrations of previous explorers, seemingly reenacting their adventures in this same dungeon. One of those characters is an Argonian named Watches the Roots. This is a clear reference by Bethesda to the book The Marriage of Heaven and Hell by William Blake, where one of the proverbs of hell in the novel reads as follows, quote, The rat, the moose, the fox, the rabbit, watch the roots. The lion, the tiger, the horse, the elephant, watch the fruits. A fun poem to say, despite the rather dark connotation behind it. Likewise, we later learn that our friend Watches the Roots suffered a fairly dark fate himself. Perhaps there was a little bit of foreshadowing going on here. Coming in at number 8, we return to Winterhold and set our gaze upon her mountains, where east of the Wayward Pass and west of Azura's Shrine, a strange Dwemer structure can be spotted at one of the peaks. Three stone pillars, with a dwarven bust plastered onto the middle one, overlooking the entire province. Before the shrine will be two chests, almost as if they're an offering of sorts. Now, to those familiar with the dwarves, this whole scene should come off as strange. The Dwemer were staunch in their refusal to worship any gods or engage in any religious ceremonies. It wasn't that they didn't believe in the existence of these deities, they just saw themselves as equal to the divines. So the fact that they would erect a structure like this and seemingly bestow offerings upon it is very unlike them. Additionally, even weirder, is that on top of that central pillar the bust is attached to will be a large amalgamation of potions. The potions themselves don't seem to have a theme to them. There's one of True Shot, another of Water Breathing, another of Restore Health. It's really odd. I quite frankly have no theories to explain this away. Heck, clearly this area has been untouched by humans for centuries. You would imagine that the wind would have at least tipped the bottles over or something, but apparently not. No matter, I suppose not every question is going to get an answer. Getting close to the end here at number 9, the Breton Herloon Lafair is one of many shady merchants the player will eventually find in the Thieves Guild Cistern. As you advance through the faction's questline and it grows, he specializes as an apothecary, distributing all sorts of alchemical ingredients to Riften's criminal underworld. What one may find interesting about Mr. Lafair, however, is that selling shady supplies to shady people underground is apparently a family tradition of sorts. As in the Elder Scrolls Online, a game taking place many eras before Skyrim, one can meet a Breton man named Stelven Lothair, operating underneath Devon's Watch, a similar outlaw's refuge in Morrowind. Stelven doesn't have much to say, other than that he's always being pursued by the authorities, but acts as a common merchant players can trade with. So, over a thousand years before he was born, Herlin's ancestors were perfecting the trade he himself would ultimately be taking up. And finally, last on our list, during the Daedric quest, The Cursed Tribe, the player will help a group of orcs defeat some giants who have been harassing them. After slaying the beasts, you'll earn a unique orcish warhammer, called Shagrel's Warhammer, which is pretty pathetic if I'm being honest, at least for a quest item, dealing 21 points of base damage and selling for 200 gold. Thankfully, upon returning to the orcish stronghold, Malakath, their patron Daedric god, will reward you generously by transforming Shagrel's Warhammer into Volundrung, a much more powerful item with a completely different model and texture. 
And after you get that, the quest will be completed. That said, something the game doesn't tell you so explicitly is Shackrell's Warhammer likely belonged to a character we could have met in a previous Elder Scrolls title, as Shagrol Gro Uzug was an orcish warrior who lived at Battlehorn Castle and would help the player train in light or heavy armor and weapons. Among his unique items was a special Warhammer he would use for sparring. So it would appear, quite unsettlingly, that centuries after we met him in Oblivion, Shackrell's special Warhammer somehow ended up in the hands of giants. It looks like our big green friend may have met a pretty uncomfortable fate. And with that, we are going to wrap up our 50th episode of 10 Tiny Details You May Still Have Missed in The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. That is officially 500 facts so far. 500 Talos Almighty. Thank you so much for stopping by, everybody. Especially to those of you who have been waiting through all 500. As you can probably imagine, I'm always on the hunt for more Easter eggs and hidden Skyrim facts. So, if you know of any I've yet to cover, or don't think I've covered yet, please drop a suggestion down below. As always, like ratings are very much appreciated. Again, thanks for watching, and I hope to catch you all in my next video. Peace out, everyone.